I just want to remind you of how we started and pressure volume. There's other types of little curves. There's isochords and isobars, and this is an isotherm. And of course, a perfect gas uh, follows a very um, 1 over x type of uh, behavior, and that's PV equals nRT. And again, very childish, but we know now that at this point that PV equals nRT surprisingly works shockingly well, you know, within like 0.1 of a percent for gas is close to room temperature and pressure. Uh, and then it can get spectacularly far off if you're under extreme conditions. Uh, in fact, even the Vander Waals can be way off under extreme conditions. This brings me to my next point. The kind of behavior you see under extreme conditions is kind of like this, where the pressure drops really quickly, and then you can get like the shelf behavior. You can see behavior like this. This is clearly for a real gas. Uh, and um, the behavior can be quite complex, like I just drew here. And what we did with this, uh, we introduced different equations to, to put that can describe these wiggles. And one of them is the virial. And I haven't had you do much with the virial, and I don't recall if it's on the test. Uh, but let's go on and just write it down. And I remember in class I had a, I choked a little bit whether I had a V or a VM, but regardless. Now one reason, and I have to admit, I should have watched the video to see how I choked on, on that. I think that was the second class. But I, I didn't because of a good reason. Uh, because what I do with the virial equation, I tend to use this as, like, uh, tell me the units of, of the C coefficient. I, I tend to use it for things like that. Um, what's D, P, D, D, P, D, T for the, with the virial equation? So it's just a little tool I use for, for simple questions. And uh, there's a lot of fairly simple questions on this exam. So uh, remember, this is simply a Taylor series. It's stunningly accurate because the constants are temperature dependent. So for every gas, you have a different V coefficient. You have a different V coefficient for every gas at every different temperature. So it just becomes this matrix of data that's designed to fit uh, gas behavior. What's kind of silly about that is that if you look at where, you know, like steam tables, right, engineers have simply tabulated uh, PV and RT data for gases just across the board for all temperatures and pressures uh, in case you need to know them. Uh, okay, anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, again, so I don't care too much about the variable, but the Van der Waals, uh, and I tend to just write VDW Van der Waals, and I'll write it out here. Uh, this it tends to be my tool for a lot of things, and it definitely is on the test. Um, it comes in two forms. I call this the N form, where N explicitly appears. And uh, then I have the PM form, which I'll also write. Uh, that's when I absorb uh, the end uh, number of moles into, into volume. It, it's, the reason that I, I do that is because it's much easier to do derivations. Uh, it's just less stuff to write. Uh, N is always a constant, right? When we get to chemical reactions, I'll let N change. But for the most part, the magic cylinder has no holes in it, right? So N is always a constant. So that's why I like to put it that way. OK, now I introduced this. And again, when I have such a simple equation, I can only get simple results, but the complexity has to require requires a more complex function. Those go hand in hand. And no matter what you write, you're going to get a better fit, especially when you have empirical parameters. Um, and that's all, I mean, this is all well known. I mean, I don't need a class to know that I can fit a Taylor series to data, or, or I've got more parameters that are empirical, of course I'm going to get a better fit. But where Van der Waals wins the Nobel Prize is that these A and B mean things, and they can be related as you've done in your homework. Remember, we're measuring pressure temperature in a leather balloon, which looks like a cow's head because that's where it came from, and I can know the, the size of an atom. I mean, that, so that's really quite surprising. Um, now, hold on, before I get, again, I'm getting ahead of myself, one of, my, one of the easiest ones is, um, let's say at low volume, at low volume, uh, we can manipulate the Van der Waals as follows. We can just say that, sorry, sorry, at low, pre at low pressure, low pressure, high volume. Uh, 
uh, sorry, volume per mole. Um, yeah, volume per mole. What you can do is you can get P minus, uh, you know, I better follow up my notes in case I, I, I tend to go off the reservation here a little bit. So um, where, where am I at? Um, P minus RT over VM. And if you recall what I do, if I have very high volume, I can just forget the B. And what I recognize this is the real gas pressure minus the perfect gas pressure. And of course, I'm left with A over VM squared. So these are the kinds of things. I, I definitely have something like this on the test, where you take a real gas equation and you use algebra to manipulate it in a way that generally is done in two or three steps at most. If I had you do something like this on the exam, it's algebra. You can't get lost in algebra. I mean, algebra can be done in an infinite number of steps if you go in the wrong direction continuously. If you find that you, I have an algebra question like this and you're not there in two or three steps, just stop. Uh, go do other questions. There's plenty of other questions you have to do and come back to it. Your mind is doing this subconsciously. You don't know it, but your mind is doing it subconsciously. When you go back to it, you'll, you'll get it. Uh, again, I, I will be... If you are writing down 20 steps, you are so far off, just stop. You're not getting anywhere. Nothing is done in 20 steps. Professor? Yet I see it every time. Question? Can you explain why the B goes to zero as well? Well, I'm just approximate. Um, <coughs> you know, I should, it, it's an approximation. I don't, have anywhere to, I don't have anywhere to put that. Remember, what we were doing here was try, trying to understand what A and B do. And we did that by doing algebraic manipulations and approximations. So at, very, at low pressures, which requires high volume, Vm minus B is basically Vm, because B is a tiny, tiny number. Uh, and then I can see at very low pressures that the difference between, yeah, I forgot, <laughs> actually I'm off track, the real gas pressure minus the perfect ga gas pressure is a negative quantity. That means that the real gas pressure is always less than the perfect gas, perfect gas pressure. That's kind of interesting in its own right. And I see that this is, uh, this is due to the A parameter, which is attractive interactions. And my analogy is always like the gravitational attraction of galaxies. Only the stars are like gas molecules and gravity holds them, holds them together. It's just, I think that's a very visual way of understanding it. Although it's actually electrostatics that hold molecules together versus gravity. But I, I don't know, they seem kind of the same way. Um, okay, so this was just simple stuff, uh, algebraic things with simple equations. Uh, then, uh, and I promised you when we covered this stuff, um, Jamie, as you saw in the homework, I, I, had, I had you remind yourself of how is a perfect gas different from a real gas. And um, there were, there's actually four potential answers. And hopefully you got it's these two. One was compression factor. And uh, this is what I find tabulated uh, for gases. Um, it basically takes PV equals NRT and multiplies it by the compression factor, which just forces it to work based on experimental data. So it's called Z, and that is PVM. And although I got very flummoxed on this, uh, though, though there, there are no perfect gas pressures or volumes in here. Those are the real gas pressures and volumes. Um, so normally PVM over RT, that would be one. If you had a perfect gas and nitrogen at room temperature and pressure would be, have, would have a compression factor close to one. But um, other gases not so much, especially at high temperatures or high pressures. And, and again, see what Z does, it just scales it. It scales. It scales the perfect gas um, equation to equal the, the experimental result, which is sensible. Let me tabulate these and then we know. Uh, okay, and what do I want to do with this? Um, okay, so I can then see, like, again, knowing that this is the real gas pressure, I can, I can see that I would take something like the van der Waals and just multiply it by V um, divided by RT, and bam, I get the compression factor. Let me just show that. And you saw this before. Okay, so I know P is RT VM minus B. Okay, I haven't written the whole thing out, but again, I just multiply by VM and I divide by RT. Uh, so I got VM, I got RT. Oh, I can't forget my A, uh, VM, RT, VM squared, or, sorry, RT, VM squared. And I'm sure I've, a little piggy has run past me at this point anyway. Uh, so, uh, then again, remember this is really, this is all kind of a joke, right? This is all just middle school algebra. Um, but what I can see from here, 
uh, RTVM. I can see immediately uh, that Z should be close to 1, and I can uh, figure out other things like, like the B parameter drives it up. So this is the kind of thing I might do. Uh, you see me do this on homework. Maybe question A is to derive the compression factor, and then question B gives you the compression factor and say, hey, what is, does B drive Z up? I have questions like that on the exam. Does B drive Z up, does it? You guys tell me? Yes. Yeah, of course it does, because this is, put in numbers, right? Remember I told you to put in numbers if you're not sure. If your gut tells you something, we'll put in numbers. Don't put in one or two, though. Five over five minus one. It's a bigger number, right? It's a bigger number than one. So there you go. Now, of course, A is always positive, so that drives you down. So B drives you up, and that's because, of course, that's the volume of the gas, and A drives you down. And remember, you can think of Z as being like a correction to the pressure. Um, yeah, so it's like a correction to the pressure. So uh, 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 it's a correction for what, what did you really measure for the pressure versus what you should have if it was a perfect gas. Uh, the fact that one way to look at this is that when whatever you think the volume is, so you have a meter by meter by meter uh, cube uh, box, you actually don't. It's a little bit smaller than that because you failed to account that you lost some volume, volume to the molecules themselves. And that would naturally drive the pressure higher than you thought, because you actually have a smaller volume. And then A, of course, drives you down. It's a little harder to visualize, but, but there you go. Um, now, that was the compression factor. Uh, then we also had residual volume, uh, which was a tad bit more complicated. Uh, that is defined as a limit, so that's why, um, that's why this guy gets a little bit more complicated of the volume of a, of a real gas minus the perfect gas. Now, um, there's a reason I do compression factor first. It's really very easy, very easy to understand. Uh, the thing that it was very difficult about is, well, it's not really difficult at all, but anyway, uh, you have to use this little factoid uh, to, uh, to solve all our derivations using the uh, using compression factor. Uh, if you recall that anyway, um, I'm just pointing out that, uh, again, you don't see any little knots. So a, a real gas, this is a real gas. A real gas, when the pressure is very low, behaves like a perfect gas. Right? Now notice, notice I didn't say that a real gas equals one. A perfect gas always equals one. That's why I'm saying a real gas at the limit of low pressure behaves like a perfect gas because a, because a perfect gas, this ratio is one. Okay, now what you do with this this was a, a, a bit of a pain in the rear end, and I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna do it because uh, it's just a bunch of algebra. Again, that's my point. All of this is just a bunch of algebra, but I just want to remind you what the Van der Waals result was. Um, uh, oh God, actually, no, I forgot. Oh, it's right here. B minus A over uh, PVM. Now again, remember that there was a fair amount of algebra, and then you had to use this limit. Just watch the video, look at your notes, it's in the book. Uh, and again, I can see that uh, the volume I should have, the, the, the volume I measure minus the volume I should have, I have a little bit more volume than I thought. That's the volume of the gas themselves. I had failed to consider that when I thought I had a perfect gas. Perfect gases have no volume, they don't interact. Oh, again, shading that off. Always a little harder to visualize is the A parameter that kind of shrinks it back down again. So those, that's, that's always a real push-pull with with the volume of the gas versus its attractive interactions. They, they tend to work against each other. Things like nitrogen, uh, those tend to balance each other almost perfectly, and, and hydrogen. Hydrogen tends to be more B-centered, and, and then everything else tends to be more A-centered, like xenon and water and whatnot. Okay, now, uh, this is all stuff that I did in class, but now let me give you a little bit of an idea. Now that you've advanced a bit, I'm gonna throw a, kind of a harder question at you, but it's actually incredibly easy at this point. That, that's, my, that's my point um, about you know, how you advance in this class. So I'm going to give you an idea. Now, this is not a question on the exam, but I have one like this. And you should, you're going to be able to hack this just fine. And it's also going to emphasize the point that you've got to be able to do first semester calc. By first semester, I mean calc that you learned within the first month. Or, or better yet, high school calc. You took calc in high school. OK, here's an example of a question I, I'm comfortable with asking now. Now that you've been saturated, you've, you've done you've done this stuff so many times. Now this really should be trivial. Um, okay, so imagine I ask this: How is this 
the PDD. I'll do the. Um, how does this compare for a real gas versus a perfect gas? How does the PDV compare for a real gas versus a perfect gas? Now, for one, you should know it's negative. I might ask that. Actually, not because that's that's too that's too simple. If volume goes up, pressure goes down. That's negative. Now you, you should be able to do that. Let's do a perfect gas. Uh, so change in P is nRT over V. Uh, oh, oh, I'm doing a VM, so I just got to do that. And I'm doing that because I'm doing VM because I'm going to use the Van der Waals equation. And of course, I'll make sure that I'll tell you what I want you to do, because otherwise you're not sure. You can use the very old thing. Oh, minus. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so you can do this very childish type of der derivation. Then you have to show that you can do some very basic um, algebra with the Van der Waals equation. And um, uh, let, I'll, I'll write it up here so that you can follow along. Again, the board. It's so weird not to have two boards. Um, you know, I've got some of the old videos from last year's class up. Maybe some of you found those. It's on a different YouTube channel. Okay, anyway, I just want you to be able to follow along. I think I need a new pen as well. God knows I got this memorized. Of course, it's on the cheat sheet. I'll send you the cheat sheet. Okay, this, I actually, I kind of like, I'm glad that this got brought up because this is a slightly, slightly, slightly harder derivation because maybe you forgot what happens when you have a, a, a function. You know, instead of 1 over vm, it's 1 over vm minus b. Uh, it's very trivial. Minus rt minus from the vm minus b being in the uh, denominator. That's you know, squared. Okay, uh-oh, uh-oh, but then I've got this. I've got to do the derivative of 1 over x squared, and that's minus 2x cubed. There we go. Now you have a pen full of ink. Okay, so you do the derivation and you get this. And I can see already um, that I have something that looks like it augments it in a negative way. Uh, okay, remember, the PDV is negative. If uh, volume goes up, pressure goes down. I'm wondering, is it a bigger negative number? Is it for a perfect gas versus a real gas, according to this? <coughs> what do you think? So, it's a bigger negative number. Remember I said 5 over 5 minus 1? Now do 5 over 5 minus 1 squared versus 5 over 5 squared, right? Just plug in numbers. Yes, this is a bigger negative number. Um, so this is more, oh. Okay, that means that if the pressure goes up, the volume goes up, the pressure goes down even more. Okay, now what about this? This actually goes the other way. So less, less umph. Okay, so, so it's kind of hard to say. Uh, so this is why I don't have this question, because I realized this when I was writing the test. It's actually hard to say whether, uh, whether the DP, DDM is more or less compared to a real gas. You'd actually have to know B and A, and I can imagine that maybe nitrogen, it evens out hydrogen, not so much. You know, anyway. Um, so yeah, so what I see here is that, let's say, um, if, if volume goes up, let's say, no, sorry, let's make volume go down and pressure goes up, and that's augmented by the B parameter. And that's because I have less volume, right? So I'd expect, expect pressure to go up higher than I'd expect. Compared to a perfect gas, if I have a real gas, I'm miscalculating the volume. I have less volume than I think, and therefore I expect a greater pressure or pressure increase. And that's what this does, and then vice versa. So it, so it makes sense. Okay, here's another question. All of these real gas equations, they ought to collapse into a perfect gas. Does this? Let's see. If, um, well, of course, what I'm really testing is, do you know that B equals zero or A equals zero? I forgot the units. I had told you not to do that. RT over VM. Minus zero, right? Okay, so if you plug in uh, A and B is equal to zero, uh, you, you better get the perfect gas equation. Now, I had to do this on the, maybe maybe I didn't have to do this on the homework. This is why maybe it's on the test. That applies to derivatives in integrals. It still should work. So if I plug in B and A at zero, do I get the perfect gas equation? The, 
perfect gas derivatives? No. Do you? Yeah. Right. Minus RT, VM minus B, well that's just VM squared, and then this term is gone. Oh, same thing. Right. It all works. I mean, yeah, it, it has to be. Anyway, so look out for, so this is kind of how I'll be trickier than what you've seen before on the test. So, anyway. I do have a couple of questions you haven't quite seen before, but when I do, it's like this. You are perfectly capable of doing it, so don't don't even worry. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, any questions uh, from there? Because then we go on to thermo. Uh, again, I do have maybe a li little bit less than a third of the test, less than a third of the test of this kind of stuff, because we spent a lot of time on thermo. Uh, I just went over it. You know, I'm actually going over some of the stuff that we did earlier more than the stuff we did recently, because you remember that. And I do that on purpose. It's also because I just finished writing my notes. Uh, and I'm also going to go over thermo, not in the order that we did it, because again, I'm going to do it in a way that's the most impactful and makes more sense, especially now that you know more stuff. So I'm going to start the um, Okay, so when we started thermo, uh, again, I'm actually not going to quite start exactly in order. But a good way to start, let's put it that way, is with the equal partition theorem. And uh, that uh, describes uh, internal energy and internal energy per mole. Uh, I tend to forget putting that UM here when I use R as versus KB. Uh, and don't worry about that. If, if, if I or if you screw that up, I'm not going to, I'm just going to ignore that. Okay, so this describes the energy a molecule has. Now there's not any nuclear energy in there, nor is there any bond energy. That's going to come up when we start doing chemical reactions. Uh, this is all the kind, you know, we have to be selective about the type of energy. There's um, the weak nuclear force. There, there's energy there, but I don't see that in here. I, I guess I can put it in, I don't know how. Anyway, the type of energy we have in here is relevant to PV, to making a gas car go down the down the road, right? So, uh, so that means that that type of energy is all in the degrees of freedom, and so let's put that. The degrees of freedom are three translations, and that's always true. Everything can translate in three dimensions, and for argon and neon, you're done. So you get three halves. RT is the internal energy of uh, of neon and blah blah blah. Okay, then you could have two rotations or three rotations, and that's for linear. Uh, that means N2 or CO2. Uh, and then three rotations for um, all else. Uh, methane. I, I usually pick methane because right, it's, it's energy class, so methane. Uh, and remember, this is actually just because for the same reason that we have three translations, we have uh, three rotations as well. Because we live in three dimensions, it's the same thing. And when 346, we actually talk a little bit about topology, how uh, you have things like, like a dinner plate is a symmetric <coughs> top. Well, that might be like a benzene ring, right? Uh, so anyway, there's ways to describe molecules such that you know how many ways they rotate. It's not important, it's linear versus nonlinear. We're, we're going to cover that next semester. Um, Okay, so that means that N2CO2 have five halves, RT of uh, internal energy, and methane has three RT of internal energy. Uh, then you get into the vibrations, uh, for which there are three N minus five or six, depending on the number of rotations, but they don't really contribute for all the reasons we talked about, uh, that all of this is dependent on your ability to put energy in and take it out later. Uh, if I want my, if I want fuel for my car, and my car will have expanding pistons that turn a crankshaft, then I need to put energy into that gas, uh, have it do work, and then, of course then the energy comes out. I've got to be able to do that, but vibrations just sit there laughing at you. Uh, N2 just does this. It just does this. Unless it gets really hot, it just does this. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. So we just forget the vibrations. And I mentioned to you that we are very close. Room temperature is awfully close to the, the energy in room temperature, which is RT, is almost enough to start exciting vibrations. And that's why you see heat capacities being a little bit higher 
than what you expect here. And before I get into that, um, okay, let, let me go ahead and start doing magic cylinder questions. You've got two magic cylinder questions, I think. You definitely have one of them. One of them is in the hard section. Remember, I've got explain the words, which is very simple, some units questions, which is dimension analysis. Then I've got nachos with salsa, which are easy questions. And then I've got the wings with habanero sauce, which are two very hard questions. Not, not really. When you see the answer key, you'll be like, oh, that's easy. Uh, one is a magic cylinder question, one's a derivation question. Um, okay, anyway, so magic cylinder questions, let's think about uh, isothermal, reversible, irreversible. Okay, whatever, isothermal. Obviously, I'm going to ask what's the change in U, and you put zero. And that's because of the equal partition theorem right there. And of course, that means that. Um, don't forget that delta U is UF minus, it helps if you see it this way, and I, I had never put it this way before my previous classes. But then when you, when you think about delta U as being UF minus UI, uh, final minus initial, and you see in here, the only thing that can be different is temperature, uh, and the temperatures are the same, well, it, it's, it's much more clear that, yeah, <coughs> nothing really happened there. However, now this is where I'm gonna go out of order, because I don't want you to get confused on this. We just started doing some funkier stuff in this class. Uh, we did Jewel, Jewel and Jewel Thompson, which I don't think actually make it to the test, by the way. I uh, can't, I'm not quite done yet, but you know that, okay, I introduced this early into the class, but in the last class, I started talking about this stuff. Um, the UDT, the UDV at constant T, uh, it's not quite equal to zero joules per meter cube. Remember, that's from the Joule experiment. Okay, so it turns out that um, it's small, but not quite zero. So, you know, I, I know, this is why I'm hoping that this is not confusing. Your whole life, everything has been simplified, and basically as you go up and up and up the education food chain, uh, you get told more of the real truth because we kind of think you can handle, handle it better, especially handle the math better. So even at the beginning of this class, I was simplifying things over, overly so. Just to get the words in, so you know what the words are, get the concepts in, and then I'm going to modify them. Okay, so you were introduced to the Joule um, effect, and so that means that this isn't quite true, depending on the nature of the process. Uh, now, what's actually happening here, it, it depends on the degrees of freedom, right? Because <coughs> what can happen is, is that the degrees of freedom is more malleable than you think. And again, now this isn't going to be on the first test. It will be on the second. But now the way this works is, let's, let's take xenon. This is kind of an extreme example. Okay, it turns out that even at room temperature, <coughs> what can happen is you can have two xenon atoms that get right next to each other. And let's say that they're, they're moving very slowly. When I have a balloon of gas, some of the gas molecules are moving very fast and some are moving very slow. They have some average temperature, which is uh, average speed, which is consistent with their temperature. But some of them are moving slowly, some of them are moving quickly. And so if two of these get next to each other, you know that they can have a dispersive dipole-dipole interaction that causes, um, the damnedest thing is it's like, it's like they're bonded. They will become transiently bonded, and then they have a very low energy vibration that can accept and release energy. In other words, Two cold gas molecules can kind of float next to each other. They can transiently bond, uh, accept energy, release energy, until another one comes along and knocks them back. You know, it's like a big game of billiards, right? So, um, so our definition of degrees of freedom is really nebulous. It's quantum mechanical, and it really gives you a headache. Uh, so, so this is the kind of things that happen that cause these ideal situations to not be so ideal. Notice that I'm describing a very Van der Waals type of A interaction, right? Which is the source of non-ideality. Which is, after the first test, you're gonna do a thermodynamic proof, and when you, uh, you have to use entropy to do it, which is why we haven't done it yet. When you use PV equals NRT, when you do the proof, you're gonna get zero. When you use the Van der Waals, you won't get zero. So anyway, but that's on the second test. I just. I, want, I just want to make sure that you're clear on what's what because, because I've been overly simplifying things uh, and we're going to stick to that, but on the next test expect that to be different, but not today. Okay, likewise, let's do um, change in U versus the change in temperature, constant volume, and, and again, that's heat capacity. 
And uh, now again, we're going to stick with our, uh, let's go back to kind of a simple um, description, one half R degrees of freedom. So you had that on your homework where you looked at a chart of heat capacities. And for the most part, that, that worked out. Um, the heat capacity of argon was close to 3 halves R. The, the heat capacity of nitrogen was close to 5 halves R. Again, there's some imperfections, and you know, now you see why. You also had a homework question on that, so this is all kind of the same thing. Um, and methane was, was a little higher than 3R. Uh, and what we can do with this is, um, now I talked about magic cylinder questions, and isothermal, reversible, irreversible, then you had 80 beta. I'm going to cover 80 beta in a second, reversible, irreversible. But you recall that there's one type of question, you had one on your homework, and let's say that might have made it to the test that's a little outside of the, that normal paradigm of isothermal, reversible, irreversible, adiabatic, reversible, irreversible. Almost all the magic cylinder questions look like that, but I have one that's slightly different. And that was when I have, let's say I have a box, and it's full of a gas, maybe it's a mold of gas, the, the volume is one liter, the temperature is room temperature, yada, yada, yada. And what I do is I have a filament inside of it, and that imparts 100 joules of energy. Right? And then I say, hey, what's the temperature change? And look, that's an incredibly simple question. You just look at the heat capacity. Uh, and you know that the heat capacity is, um, uh, another definition of that is, um, um, now I'm blanking out. Uh, is this right? Yeah, change in heat, change in temperature is right. There we go. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Anyway, okay, so, so you can figure out the, the change in temperature. Now, here's the thing. I want to point out that, see, one of you has even asked me about this before. The reason it's a little different than um, the normal magic cylinder is that normally in the magic, the metal magic cylinder, if I, if I heat something up by doing work, by doing a compression, the heat just comes out in your isothermal. Uh, so this is kind of funky because I have to impart heat, but it also has to be wrapped in glass wool because the temperature can't change, right? Because then what's the point? So what I have to do is maybe have a little filament inside of it that imparts at 100 joules. The temperature gets high and it stays there so you can measure it. Measure it, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now what would be the change in U? Well, now let's, let's go to a different definition of U as the change in work plus the change in heat. Um, it's uh, a rigid box, so it's the change in U. And uh, there you go. And um, of course that's still CV delta T. And yeah, okay, so, so look at this. So I asked a magic cylinder question, sorry, not a magic cylinder question, a slightly different type of question, but you've got delta U. Of course, I also asked delta H, and delta H, of course, is delta U plus delta PV. And of course, this is all on the cheat sheet, so don't think you have to memorize it. You know, it is true, though, that if you do have it in your head, it's going to go better, uh, but again, but, you know, I, I hate to say that because I don't want you memorizing any. I, want, I don't want you to memorize too much. I, you know, too much stuff. Okay, now again to put some little flesh on the bone. That CV delta T. Now remember the trick with change in PV and enthalpy, uh, because um, you know, God forbid, pressure and volume could both be changing. This can get kind of confusing sometimes. Uh, what we can do is make that NR delta T. Again, we're still sticking with perfect gases on this test. We'll, we'll do more gas imperfections. Jewel Thompson, more of that next test, not now. Okay, but then hopefully you notice that I can then um, factor, factor the delta T. I have no idea if this is making it to the camera and show that that's uh, CP delta T. Okay, and again, you know that CP is uh, CD plus NR. We even did a derivation on that. Uh, oh, and that brings me to another point. Uh, so I do have derivation questions like you've seen. What I tend to do is I, I will pick a derivation that I did in class. There's typically, for every derivation that I do in class, there's about five others to do exactly the same. Some of them are actually easier than what I do in class. I actually pick a harder one in class because it's, it's harder. It, it makes you better. But on the test, I'll put on, a, I'll put on an easier one. The reason I do that is because you know the answer, right? It, but that doesn't really help. It just makes you more confident. 
if you don't, I mean, you know the answer, so what? You still have to get there. And to do that, you have to just do some basic, basic remember that another thing about these uh, types of derivations, the thermodynamic derivations, they're actually really algebraic, more than calculus. Uh, unless you have to do like a DPDV. Anyway, okay, I'm dabbling at this point. Um, okay, so that's, that's a type of question that's a little bit off the paradigm of the magic cylinder. Let's go back to the magic cylinder, because of course I do have magic cylinder stuff, and God knows the second test. By the way, the second test, well, test one and test two are definitely cumulative. Test three, not so much, because we actually cover different things. Um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Let's go back to isothermal. And, uh, oh God, okay, I'm kind of almost out of time because I want to answer some of your questions. I, I think I'm going to be a little bit off. Um, okay, so, uh, so I'm going to have to kind of speed up a little bit, but again, I, I want to spend more time earlier on because that's the point you may have forgotten. Uh, so remember that work is minus exterior pressure change in volume. And remember that we have something of the form X, uh, y dx so that has to be inexact. Remember we covered that one day, so this is inexact. That means it's path dependent, and so we have irreversible, where the exterior pressure is a constant. And that means that when we integrate, uh, you get this. Uh, here, I'm just going to write it for the sake of uh, simplicity. Remember that this is, if I ask these questions, you're lucky. These are the easy ones. Not that reversible is that much harder. Okay, but this is what you got to look out for. In reversible, the exterior pressure is matched to the interior pressure. That's an outside actor doing that. So I have a highly pressurized magic cylinder, and it's, it's pressurized because I'm pushing on it. And instead of just letting go, instead of just letting go, I'm just kind of backing off on it. And so that's reversible. Now the reason that's important is that you've got to remember that you're hiding a factor of V inside the pressure. And then that affects the integration. And if you get that wrong, we still give you tons and tons of partial credit. So, but anyway. So, kind of want to remember this. Um, but again, you know, the equations are on the cheat sheet. Now I'll hand the cheat sheet out after <coughs> class. So if you're in the exam and you're kind of blanking out, that, that'll help you remember. Okay, um, the last bit, last bit I want to go over is 80, 80 baby. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna barely have five minutes left over, so I'm gonna go kind of fast here. I'm just gonna tell you again, Jewel and Jewel Thompson. I think I didn't put those on the test. I, I thought I would, but it looks like I didn't. I'll let you know if I decide otherwise. I still have two questions left, so I'm just not gonna talk about that. Uh, when it comes to adiabatic, remember that you better write this down first. Uh, but oddly enough, remember that it's not, that doesn't mean that heat suddenly stopped existing or that the interior of the magic cylinder isn't hot and that that heat can't do anything. It still can. In fact, it's even more important to think about it. Um, uh, the thing that's difficult is that PV and T are all changing. Um, and that means that figuring out like the final temperature, the final pressure, the final volume, that becomes insanely difficult. Uh, now, I know that the change in U is, of course, minus PdV. That's because it's uh, equal to work because there's no heat. Um, one equation doesn't solve two unknowns. That's the problem. So what you do is, and you definitely want to be able to do this, by the way, is remember that due to exactness, we can calculate changes along paths that, that didn't actually happen. So this first path is zero uh, because it's isothermal. The second path involves a heat exchange that never occurred because it's adiabatic, but that don't matter. I see that there's a temperature change at constant volume, and therefore that's, that's, that's true. Okay, from there, uh, again, we're gonna see an example of don't forget uh, that P is hiding NRT over V, DV is CV, DT. Okay, and then a um, couple of steps. So you might imagine I would avoid asking a question like this, except on maybe the extra credit, because uh, the extra credit, anything can go. Uh, but what you, what you do after some integration, you find that VF over VI uh, is equal to TI over TF. 
to the CD over in our. Uh, don't forget that there's, uh, this is actually only one of three adiabatic equations. I call this the adiabatic equation of state. I, uh, this relates B and T, but there's one that relates P and T. You can figure that out by inserting uh, the perfect gas law for the volumes. Uh, so I've got one with P and T, and I've got one another <coughs> with P and V. So on the exam, uh, I have a bunch of adiabatic questions, uh, but I don't use the volume and temperature. I use the pressure and temperature. It's on the cheat sheet. Um, okay, last bit, and you definitely need to Should there be a negative at the top right, and RT over VDV? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a minus, there's a minus. That's why, the, that's how I always, for, thank you for pointing that out. I'll, I'll video that in later. Um, that's why, <clears throat> that's why this is VF over VI, and that's a TI over TF. They always switch, and that's because of the minus sign. Um, if you do the pressures, then that's not true. <coughs> um, in the pressure form. Uh, anyway, that, that equation's on the um, cheat sheet. Uh, that's the one you're going to end up using on the test. Uh, again, just be confident with your calculator. It's not that bad. Okay, last bit is I just want to point out the enthalpy. Uh, you can think of it as packing on the PV energy, which is something that can be used to do work. You can just take on the energy that molecules have and then add on their collective energy, uh, the PV energy. Again, that's the energy that I use to make a car go. Uh, or, or more accurately, um, remember Legendre transforms. And, and again, don't do, <laughs> do not forget this. Legendre transforms are very important. Now, that means that this function has natural variables of x and y. It, it, it's child's play. It's here. What changes this? Well, it's the change in x. F changes because x is changing. F changes because y is changing. Therefore, the natural variables are x and y. Don't forget this language. The conjugate of x is cx. The conjugate of y is cy. So when I apply that to the change in u, and remember, we haven't done one half of this yet, the entropy half, I can see that u is a function of v, and the conjugate of v is minus p. Now, don't forget that a Legendre transform takes the function and subtracts. Let's say if I don't like the y dependence on f, what I do is I subtract the conjugate times y. And the way to know that, that uh, the, the natural variable dependence has changed is to do the change. Uh, you look at the differential of the new function. And what you'll find is that um, uh, I, I'm not going to do this because I'm out of time. Uh, um, why? Okay, so I'm not going to do it, but again, it's incredibly simple as child's play uh, to show that this is the case. And you see that this new function has different natural variables, so something like that's on the exam as well. Um, Joel Thompson didn't make it to the test, and I have <laughs> three minutes to answer your questions. Yeah, yeah,